Morning, church. Let's see, uh, again, a very wonderful morning, a wonderful day that God has given us again another opportunity in, uh, in this life. And um, it's nice to see again our sister Phyllis here and um, sister Eileen, Mommy Eileen uh, is here with us this morning. To God be the glory. And this morning, uh, my dear brethren, we will be talking about the church. Okay. We will be talking about the church, about the relevant church. And uh, we will define first what the, the, what the word relevant means. Relevant according to the dictionary and to uh, the Bible dictionary. They define relevant as closely connected or appropriate to what is being done or considered appropriate to the current time, period, or circumstances of contemporary interest. Also, the word relevant, the synonyms are appropriate, meaningful, useful, important, significant, and fitting. Now, with all these definitions and synonyms in mind, the challenge with relevance is somehow, you know, the so-called churches are adapting to the culture of the current time, the current period, or the current circumstances. But is there really a problem if the church would adapt to the culture to be relevant? Okay. Is there really a problem in adapting to the culture to be relevant? Or shall we stick to the old ways? Or shall we stick to what many people call the tradition? Okay. Or can we do a, a mix? Can we do it? Uh, can we adapt the, uh, the culture of the trendy? Or can we also being trendy and being also an old school. Okay. Now, the answer is actually we can. We can be trendy, we can adapt the culture, and at the same time do it old school. Now, uh, we do it through this statement. Okay. Now, they say that the methods, the culture, the methods change, but the message, the tradition, remains the same. Now, we, we often hear the saying, right? And is this actually true? Now, let me give you an example. You know, before, uh, the, the preachers, they don't have anything to write their thoughts, to show their thoughts. They would just do, you know, talk and talk and talk. They would just go up the pulpit or somewhere on the streets and they would just talk, okay? And nowadays came along the blackboard or the green board. We have the chalk to write on it. And then we have the screen projectors. And then now we have the LEDs, the LCDs, the plasma and everything, right? So now the people, they are not only hearing what is being said, they are now seeing what is being said, okay? Now, before, uh, if you do correspondence uh, 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 lesson, it is done through mail, through postal service. Okay? When I was just starting, I, I usually, uh, I normally enroll myself on a correspondence course, and then I will wait for uh, a week, two weeks, and probably maximum one month to get the other lesson to me through postal services. But now, through technology, you'll receive it in an instant. Through what? Through emails. Right? So, in a way, this is actually true. Okay. The methods change, but the, the, the message remains 
the same. Jesus Christ, remember, he uses parables. He uses parables and, and other things symbolically, like water, like bread. So when he was talking to different people in different settings and in different cultures, Jesus adapted his teaching style to those he was talking to. His method changes, but his message remains the same. Sadly to say, in reality, my dear brethren and friends, this is not true amongst many churches today. The method changes, and so does the message, which is really unfortunate. Now, let me tell you why and how come. But first, let me ask this question. How do you determine relevancy? How do you determine if you're relevant or not? How do you determine if the church is relevant or not? Now, the answer is you take a survey. Or some would say you take a poll. You know, politicians, they use this. They use surveys. They use polls. We use that in politics. Businessmen use it for product updates, for product development, and for future product improvements. You know, we use surveys in the government. And here they are using surveys also so that uh, they could get pieces of information from the constituents about what added services or what added programs that the constituent needs. So they use surveys. Right? Starting entrepreneurs, they use surveys. They, 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 they disseminate, disseminate polls. For what? So that they could have what they call feasibility studies. So that they could gauge if the business that they were trying to get into would be profitable or not. So they take surveys. They use surveys. Now, with this in mind, I see nothing wrong in taking surveys for the church to use. And in fact, we do ask the members what they want in the church. Right? We do have meetings. Many, many congregations, many, many churches do have meetings. Okay. Now, when we do surveys or when we do polls, what are we actually doing? What are we trying to accomplish? Now, for those uh, who are with us in our Christ Ambassadors course, we are actually doing what? We are actually doing the eyes, right, Brother Derek? Brother Derek told us about DI, developing interest. And that's actually what surveys are. And that's what actually polls are. We develop interest. We're trying to get the interest of the people. We do. DIs, what topic interests you most, right? Sounds familiar? We do that often, and we should be doing that, okay? Now, we are doing that because we want to have a common ground in which to talk about. We, 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 we are doing that to have a common ground so that we could get the interest of the other person to study the Bible with us. And when we establish that, we can therefore start sharing the gospel. Right? Now, here is the problem. Churches use surveys for what? To give what people want and not what God wants them to have. And this is happening. Some churches don't use surveys. They don't use polls. But they use what they call through observation. They observe what are the trendy. They observe as a means of getting to know what the culture or what the people like. Okay. So there was this uh, one known um, church leader, and it is, this is in the internet. Okay. He used a, a survey asking the, the members and asking the community <clears throat> what they want to be added to their praise and worship service. 
Then the survey came back. And when they go through the surveys, they found out that these are what the people and the, what the members wanted to have in, in their worship. So what they did was they add everything they could to the service, uh, in their service. And lo and behold, you are like in a concert. You are like in a magic show right, with light effects and smoke effects, right? Now, in, in, in politics, now they say that you have to be what the people want you to be to win. Right? You have to be what the people want you to be. You know, you, you, you dance with them. You sing with them. Even if you're not really doing those things. You, you smile. Even if you're not really that smiling person. You put on that, what they say, a, a poker face. Right? And you are doing this because you, you want to win. You want to get the votes of the people. You want to, to, to get their, their attention. You want to win the people. Now, normally, the campaign strategists, you know, they will just tell the, their politicians, you know, just, just go along with what the people want. And this, will not be take, this won't take long. You know, being, uh, going along with them will just probably a month, just during the campaign period. And after you win, then you can go back to your old way. So you can be uh, the, the, the Scrooge that you are. You know, uh, but in, in spirituality, we cannot do this. When, we, when we're talking about souls, when we're talking about God, we cannot do this. You know, we are, because we are after the praises of God. We are not after what Brother Joe, what Brother Ryan wants. I'm not after their praises. We are after the praises of God, right? And, you know, there are a lot of people that are trying to use, they are trying to see the trend and adapt to the culture so that they could fill up the whole building, so they could fill up the whole pew and have what they call an SRO, standing room only. To be honest, not to be hypocrite, you know, we all love that. We all love that this building will be jam-packed with true worshipers of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? But we will not do that at the expense of the truth, right? Now, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, about this. Anyway, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. It says, For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and they will look for teachers who will tell them <clears throat> whatever their itching ears want to hear. You know, this had been said long, long time ago. And this is happening nowadays. People are leaving the body of Christ because they don't want to hear the truth. And that they just cannot let go of their uh, uh, sinful nature. They cannot stand listening to what hurts them, to what hurts their ego. So, what is that they will do? This verse tells us that they will follow their own desires. And not only that, they will look for. The Bible tells us that they will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will scout the area 
to look for someone that someone's theology would fit their own theology. And so therefore they will say, oh, I will go to this church. I love this church. I love, I hate that church right there. You see, people will go and look for teachers that they would tell them what their itching ears want them to say. I did not say that. The Bible says that. Okay. Now, teachers in return will tolerate them. Teachers will break all the rules and compromise the truth just to have them inside their so-called sanctuary or church. Now, here's a question. Uh, do you know the, the band Spandau Ballet? Anybody knows the band Spandau Ballet who sang the, the song True? Or Michael Jackson? You know? Um, if we are, just for example, if you're going to the concert of Michael Jackson, you know, um, and you are comfortably sitting uh, right there just before, just, you know, uh, near the stage where Michael Jackson would perform. And then later on, you would find out that Michael Jackson will be singing at the backstage. What will you do? Probably you would walk out. Probably you'll, you'll say to the, uh, uh, to the concert organizer, I need my refund. I came here to see Michael Jackson perform and not to hear him backstage. Right? Right? <clears throat> now, what if, what if, if those bands, uh, light effects and smoke effects were all backstage? They won't be seen. They won't be seen. The performers won't be seen. Do you think the band will love that? I don't think so. Do you think the people <clears throat> worshiping would love that? Do you think that they will have the same energy, the same level of energy, or the same level of the so-called spirit-filled worship? I don't think so. Now, remember, the focus of worship is God and God alone. Remember that. And not the band, not the stage show, and not the statics, not the smoke effect, not the light effects. If we are so led, my dear brethren and friends, if we are so led by these things and other things other than God, now I read someone said, then we are spectating and not worshiping. We are compromising the gospel for the so-called progress in worship. We are compromising the gospel for this new culture. <clears throat> we are compromising the gospel to be trendy because we are led to think that people are leaving the church because of old school and that they, gen they just cannot stand the tradition. If we will think about the logic very carefully, my dear brethren and friends, people are leaving the church because the gospel said that they cannot stand sound doctrine, period. You are leaving the church because it hurts you, and you cannot just stand the truth that's being said by the Lord Jesus Christ into your life. That's why you're leaving the gospel. Oh, you're leaving the church, sorry. Now, listen to this. The religious world wants to keep these people from leaving the church. So what we are doing, we are compromising the gospel, including myself. I will include myself to that religious world because I am compromising the gospel. Okay? And in so doing, <clears throat> we are not only compromising the gospel, we are compromising the church of Christ. They will teach and give these people what they want to hear. They are actually not saving these people because they are giving these people what they want because they are giving these people the, their desires. That's why they're leaving the church because they want to follow their own desires and me belonging to the church world, I am giving them their desires. I am not giving them the truth. 
And that's the reason why in the first place, you know, they're leaving the church of Christ. Because they want to follow their own, their own desires. What do we do instead? We give it to them. We don't stand our ground. And this happens to Jesus Christ. In John chapter 6, 14 and 15. When the people saw him do this, uh, do this miraculous sign, they exclaimed, Surely he is the prophet that we have been expecting. When Jesus saw what they were ready to force him to be their king, he slipped away into the hills by himself. Now the question is, why did Jesus slip away? Now here's a good reason. Number one, <clears throat> first, because the people thought of Jesus as some sort of a social and political hero figure. You know, that would give them an advantage and favor, you know, perhaps to alleviate their socioeconomic status and to give them favors, among uh, favors and favors, and not to be any more the marginalized in this society. And number two, they want Jesus, you know, to be what they want him to be. They want him to be what they want him to be. And, you know, they want Jesus to be their king because that's what they want him to be for the reason of personal gain. They are expecting to benefit from Jesus being their so-called king. And number three, knowing their heart's intention, Jesus withdrew from them. Withdrew from them because Jesus doesn't want to compromise. His mission is not, I repeat, his mission is not to be a political figure, but a spiritual figure for the salvation of one's soul. You see, our mission is not to go along with men, but to be obedient to the gospel whatever people might say about us. Our obedience to the gospel, our obedience to God is paramount, whatever other people would say to us. And this is now the problem with the religious world. We compromise the gospel, we water down the gospel. The methods change and the message also changes. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. My dear brethren, whatever happens, we must remain true to the gospel. Let the gospel continue to transform you and to transform those who are leaving the church of Christ by renewing their minds toward what is good and acceptable to God. And uh, one quote that I came across with, conformity is doing what everyone else is doing, regardless of what is right. Morality is doing what is right, regardless of what everyone else is doing. We should, never be comp we should never compromise the gospel. We must do what is right and stay grounded to what is right. Because at the end, it is not man that will give us the reward, but it is God. In our scripture reading, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, we must be the pillar and the ground of truth. The church must be the pillar and the ground of the truth. When it says the church is the pillar and the ground of the truth, it means that you and I, composing of the church, it is where the basis of where truth lies. We speak and we live out the truth. Now, specifically about the saving truth of the gospel. Now, second, as pillar and ground of the truth, we must be, as they say, non-collapsible. 
Though we are shaken, <clears throat> though the church are shaken right here and right there by, by so much controversies and pressures to conform to the culture, to, to conform to the trend of this world, we must not give in. We must not give in. We will not collapse. The truth will remain to be told, and the truth will remain to be upheld. Second, the church is a family. Again, going back to our scripture reading, it says there that it is the house of God. And Paul urges each and every one of us, he said that you may know how you ought to conduct yourselves in the house of God. And when we talk of the house of God, we're talking about family. The church being the house of God. It means that it is a family, a family of believers. And the head of the family, the head of the household is God. It talks about our relationship with one another as family. Now, how do you expect to be treated inside the family? Now, first and foremost, you are expecting to be treated with so much love, with respect, right, by your family. Ephesians chapter 5, 1 and 2, it says that we must be imitators of God, therefore, and walk in love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant uh, sacrificial offering to God. Now, first, Paul addressed us as a beloved children, denoting that you and I, we are part of God's family, that we are a family, the familia. And he goes on to say that he tells us to be imitators or to imitate God. Now, the word imitators is a very significant word. It is a pattern of, pattern of life. It is a way of life that every believer must follow, exemplifying how Jesus lived. And how are we to imitate Jesus? It says right there, we must walk in love. You must walk in love, being part of the God, God's household. And how is that love? manifested. It is manifested by self-sacrifice. It says that Jesus gave himself for us as a fragrant sacrificial offering to God. In general terms, self-sacrifice, it involves putting the need of others before your own. But in a more specific way, self-sacrifice is denying ourselves and carrying our cross and following Jesus Christ. Luke 9, 23. Therefore, it represents death. Self-sacrifice represents death. It means nailing our wishes, nailing our desires, nailing our passions, nailing our agendas for Christ and others, nailing it on the cross with Christ. Galatians 5.24, those who belong to Christ have been crucified, the flesh with its passions and desires. If we truly crucify ourselves, my dear brothers and sisters, with Christ, the pattern, therefore, in which we live, including all our decisions, is all based on Jesus Christ. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. <clears throat> the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. If we can just love this way, as a family, inside the church of Christ, nobody will leave the church. Nobody will leave the body of Christ. And this is how we become relevant as a family of believers. 
And number three, it says in our scripture reading that the church of the living God. It says the church of the living God, it means that the church is organic. And what does it mean when, say, when we say organic? It means it is alive because we are serving what? A living God. We are not serving a dead God, a dead end. We are serving an almighty, awesome God. Last week, I was talking to a sister, uh, to the best friend of uh, Sister Kathy, and we were talking about, you know, how, how, how do I uh, spell awesome? I told her, G-O-D, God. That's how I, I spell awesome, G-O-D, God. Right? Because we are living, we are serving a living God that the church should be organic, that the church should be alive. Therefore, the church to be relevant, it must be felt outside of these walls. It must be felt outside of its realms, and it must be felt outside of ourselves. Colossians 3 verse 12, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, Cloth yourselves, cloth yourselves with what? With compassion, with kindness, with humility, with gentleness, <clears throat> and patience. If you help the poor, you are lending to the poor, and he will repay you. One of my favorite verses. If we are helping someone, if we are compassionate, the Bible tells us, we are lending it to the Lord. And don't expect that person to return it back to you. Because who will return it back to you? The Lord will. The Lord will. See? You know, by extending love for others, because we have Jesus, by being compassionate, by being kind and helping out the needs of others outside of the walls of the church, we are also doing a self sacrifice. Now, two Sundays ago, uh, I made mention about our neighbors, who our neighbors are, and being a good Samaritan to those who are in need. If we do this, the Church of Christ will be relevant to those outside of the church. It is relevant. It is relevant. But the people outside of the church will see the church to be relevant. And as they see it relevant by the Lord's grace and mercy. They will soon come to realize that real Christians love not only with words, they love with actions. By God's grace and mercy, those people outside of these walls, outside of the Church of Christ, will come to know Christ and will come to accept Christ, baptize into Christ, because we truly imitate Jesus Christ. You know, uh, I came across this quote by Howard Hendricks, a professor of theology in the 1920s. Um, he said that people tell me they want to make the Bible relevant. Nonsense. The Bible is already relevant. You are the ones that's irrelevant. You know, oftentimes, we make the Bible, or the church for that matter, to conform to our ways of thinking, to conform to, to our liking. If it doesn't, if the church or the Bible doesn't conform to our liking, we say that they are irrelevant. They are irrelevant to us, and somehow we, we, point, we point other people to our own man-made doctrines and say this is what is relevant the truth of the matter is the bible the church the word of god and god they are relevant because it is of god you know people make it irrelevant we make it irrelevant we want almost everything we want almost all the things that we want 
to go along with us. We even want God to follow us and not God or not us to follow God. Finally, my dear brethren and friends, I will leave you this verse for our thoughts. Would you mind opening your Bible with me in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20? Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. I will leave you with this verse. Woe to those, or what sorrow for those who say that evil is good and good is evil, that dark is light and light is dark, that bitter is sweet and sweet is bitter. The gospel is yours, my dear brethren and friends. For those who are in our Zoom, we, we thank you for joining us. May the Lord bless us and may we all continue to stand our ground to preach the truth and not to conform to the pattern of this world. For those who have not yet accepted the Lord, this invitation is for you. I want you to come forward and accept the Lord Jesus Christ. Confess your sins, follow him, be faithful to the end, accept him, be baptized into his name and receive the salvation of your soul. And with that, shall we all stand as we sing the song of invitation.